This is our home in space, an island universe circled by the Milky Way. And within this glittering corral are more than 100,000 million stars. Yet this galaxy is only one of a limitless number. Each of the countless stars within our galaxy is a body like our sun. The sun that shines on us is far from the largest, yet it dwarfs the Earth on which we live. In spite of this seeming insignificance, the planet Earth has nurtured generations of men with imaginations that reach above and beyond the confines of this small spinning globe. To fly like a bird was long the desire of earthbound man. Many years before the Wright brothers made history at Kitty Hawk, men had searched for means to escape the heavy hold of gravity. Their successes were varied and limited but they took the first steps on the stairway to the stars. But every flight, every new development in aeronautics added to the cumulative knowledge necessary to lead man to the threshold of space. It is now but a matter of measurable time before a new world opens to the adventurous explorers of outer space. Muckluck hatch is secured, Commander. Thank you, Lieutenant. Zoom. Zoom. Check bilateral conning pods. Aye, aye, Commander. This is Commander of the spaceship Starskipper requesting blast-off clearance at 0100 and standing by. Prepare for blast-off, Lieutenant. Aye, aye, Commander. Hypersensitivitator intensity normal. Normal. Variation frenetic creeps at 2.06. 2.06. Check, Commander. Atomacrylacine fuel supply, normal. Fuel supply, normal, Commander. Stand by for countdown. Aye, aye, Commander. Blast off time, minus 10, 9. We've all seen eight, space flight depicted in scenes similar to this. Seven, well, it's colorful, six, but not quite scientifically accurate. Five, I'm reporter Ed Fleming. Four, I'm going to call on the help of our narrator, Michael three, Rye, and some outstanding space two, experts. We'd like to show you something of what is actually being done and plans that are projected for future explorations of the moon and our neighboring planets. Every test, every rocket flight brings us closer to the conquest of space. Now it's one thing to launch a rocket into the sky but it's something else again to envision a satellite in orbit or a space vehicle that might reach another planet, especially a manned vehicle. Right now, I'd like to get some opinions from a man who's one of the brightest names in the aviation history of our country, General James H. Doolittle, member of the National Aeronautics and Space Council and chairman of the Scientific Advisory Board to the Chief of Staff, United States Air Force. General, I know a lot of people are asking, why go to space at all? I believe the conquest of space may unlock the door to physical discoveries of the greatest value to the human race. Our leadership in the world depends on being in the forefront of these exciting discoveries. Another common question these days is, how soon will we have a man in space? That depends on many factors. We must make rapid progress, but we're not going to take chances with human lives. After more is known about the problems now being worked on, We'll orbit the Earth with a manned satellite that can return safely to home base. And someday, man will finally escape from the Earth's gravitational field and will then truly be in space. Do you feel the advantages of space control are primarily military or civilian? I believe that there are bound to be major benefits in both fields. Right now, it seems that most military missions, even in the space age, can still be carried out most effectively by using the manned aircraft and the missiles that are currently in use and under development. However, this may not always be true, and we have to consider every possibility now and in the future. Isn't that going to be expensive, both in money and in scientific effort? Yes, but we must realize the conquest of space will probably be of greater importance than we can begin to realize at the present time. 
And if we do not expend the thought, the effort, the money required, then another, more progressive nation will. It is quite possible that an aggressor nation that dominates space will then dominate the world. We just can't let that happen. Thank you, General Doolittle. In approaching the problems of the conquest of space, energy is a prime consideration. Controlled energy exceeding anything man has ever known. Already the power plants in our modern missiles are producing horsepower measured in the millions. In the thunder-filled canyons of California, we are working night and day to concentrate that power. Other considerations are trouble-free guidance controls, protection against tremendous heat and pressure, and the unknown hazards of the hostile environment of space. The reliability of both man and machinery for the slightest failure in space may be fatal. Of these, man is the greatest question. Machines can be designed and redesigned, but we have to take man as he is. Earthbound, man has evolved and developed in a protected environment. We are wrapped in a sheltering cover of atmosphere that filters out the ultraviolet rays of the sun and shields us against plunging meteorites. The higher man goes, the farther away he moves from his natural protective environment. As he climbs upward, he reaches a point where he needs an additional oxygen supply to keep breathing. Farther up, his blood would boil if he were not protected in some manner. And continuing to the lower edge of the stratosphere, he would encounter temperatures of 67 degrees below zero. We are investigating these conditions through such tests as the balloon flights of Air Force Colonel David G. Simons, carried for 32 hours in an insulated capsule the size of a telephone booth, Colonel Simons rose to an altitude of 102,000 feet. At that distance, only about 1% of the Earth's atmosphere separated him from outer space. And in September 1956, Captain Ivan Kinchelow rode the lightning of the X-2 up to 126,000 feet. However, these flights carried us only to the fringes of space. But little by little, we are opening the gates that lead to man's widest horizon. Well, everything seems to point to the fact that with proper planning and preparation, man can live in space. But there's still a great deal of research to be done before this becomes a reality. Major General Dan Ogle, the Surgeon General of the Air Force, has many of his doctors and other medical scientists working in this field. General Ogle, what is the basic function of space medicine? I would say that it is to discover how much man can adjust to the conditions of space and to help create an environment in which he can stay alive and work efficiently. And how is that done? by trying to simulate space conditions in our aeromedical laboratories and then testing man under these conditions. For example, we know now that his space cabin must be a miniature Earth with a livable atmospheric pressure plus insulation from deadly radiation, the intense heat of the sun, and the incredible cold of space itself. What's going to be the toughest problem for space pilots? Even after 10 years of Air Force space medicine research, there are probably some conditions out there we don't even know about yet. But we do know that one of our major considerations will be weightlessness. What causes weightlessness? It comes about when the space vehicle's velocity and flight path neutralizes the pull of Earth's gravity upon the ship and everything in it, including the man. That happens in outer space or in orbital flight. In space, of course, the condition can go on as long as the vehicle is out there, days, weeks, or even years. You mentioned that weightlessness could be created in a certain flight pattern. Isn't that what's known as a ballistic trajectory? Yes, let me demonstrate. Uh, 
The plane would fly a power dive first to gain speed, go into a curve, climbing like that, and it is at this point that the speed and curving of the plane exactly neutralizes the pull of gravity, and the pilot experiences a feeling of weightlessness. These are just a few of the problems we're working on, and from what we've already learned, we feel confident that man can adjust himself to conditions in space. Well, General Ogle, I'm sure we're all looking forward to that day when we can put a man in space and bring him safely back again. Thank you, General. However, before we can safely put a manned satellite into permanent orbit, there will be many experiments with unmanned craft carrying instruments. For one reason, such experiments are simpler and less expensive to project into space. The unmanned satellites will carry precise recording equipment to register the varying conditions they meet at different altitudes. These vehicles will probably be fairly simple to start with. As they grow in size, they will become more complex and more completely instrumented. With the aid of numerous scientific instruments, the unmanned satellites will give us vital information on radiation, meteorites, cosmic rays, and other aspects of the hostile environment which must be known more fully before man ventures into the dark frontiers of space. A satellite might serve as an eye in the sky for the purposes of military reconnaissance. In its flight around the Earth, it would keep a continuous watch on the land below for any indications of military buildup by potential aggressors and by means of television would relay its findings to a headquarter control station. And in this manner, it could also serve as civilian defense against freakish and destructive changes in weather conditions. A further step would be to launch a satellite to an orbit 22,000 miles above the equator. At this altitude, it would travel at the same speed as the rotation of the Earth, so that it would remain in a fixed position. This would be ideal for a wide-range radio and television transmitter. Three stationary satellites might then become an international communications network that would be of tremendous value in war or peace. But before we head for the moon, let's go through some of the steps that will get us there. The X-15 is a joint program of the Air Force, Navy, and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. It's designed for flight at altitudes never before achieved by a manned aircraft. The X-15 takes its shape from experience gained in the development of supersonic planes and missiles. But it has to be better than a missile, for it carries a human pilot, and it will have to make many flights. Suspended beneath the wing of a bomber, the X-15 is airborne for launching. Arcing up in a ballistic trajectory, it passes swiftly beyond the limits of previous manned flights. Like an arrow leaving the bow, it is in free flight after its propellant burns out. For a period of possibly four minutes along the upper curve of its arc, the pilot is in a condition of weightlessness. This offers an opportunity to study the effects of weightlessness on minds and bodies of pilots. At the top of the X-15 arc, conventional control surfaces are almost useless because of the small amount of air pressure on them. So, ingenious reaction controls have been built into the nose and wingtips to keep the ship in proper attitudes. These jets guide the plane by pushing it in opposite reaction to their force. As the plane descends in its curving flight, it plunges back into the heavier atmosphere, where its normal controls are again practical. But this heavier atmosphere develops the fierce temperatures of the thermal thicket, the heat barrier created out of speed and friction. Gradually, the pilot maneuvers out of the ballistic trajectory and circles down for a dead stick landing. As a means of getting a man into orbit, a Super X-15 has been proposed. The Super X-15 would be ground launched using a powerful liquid propellant rocket booster to supply the needed thrust. The 
booster provides the tremendous power necessary to release the grip of gravity on the plane. As the booster burns out, it drops away and the engine of the craft takes over to supply the added thrust to place it into orbit. At the speed he'll be traveling, our man in space will cover the distance from Cape Canaveral to the South Pole in approximately 45 minutes. When the time comes for a landing at Edwards Air Force Base, the pilot will fire retro rockets to drop out of his orbiting course. Then he begins his glide to Earth. This will be accomplished in a series of dips in and out of the heavier atmosphere. This will be necessary for a gradual slowing down and to prevent the plane from burning like a meteor. The plane will actually glow like metal in a blacksmith's forge as it plunges into the blanket of heavier air. The successful orbital flight of the Super X-15 will be an important step toward the conquest of the moon and the nearer planets. Now let's return to Earth for a moment and to our reporter to check on our progress in developing adequate power to accomplish this moving into and through space. Hello again. I'd like you to meet Mr. George Sutton, president of the American Rocket Society and Hunziker Professor of Aeronautical Engineering at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Mr. Sutton, how soon will we go to the moon? Well, now, that is something no one really knows. But uh, I suspect it might take 10 to 15 years. But first, we must develop manned satellites, and that is going to require a great deal of propulsive power. Here, you can see some of the largest test stands in the country. On these stands, we have tested the engines for Atlas, Thor, Jupiter, Redstone, Navajo, and other missiles. There is the signal for a test. Now, shall we watch it? the uh, rocket that was used to launch the Army Explorer satellite? Uh, that one was developed and tested right here. Of course, our first satellite weighed only over 20 pounds. But right now, we are working on engines that can deliver a thrust of 6 million pounds. And with these engines, we'll be able to put payloads of over 55 tons into orbit. Every step of the way must be thoroughly investigated before we take the giant step of sending men to the moon. Our first approaches to the moon are made with unmanned vehicles and chemical rockets. And lunar probes will be going on all the time. We're working on our man in space program. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Now, if you're all ready to head for the moon, just stand by. Before man sets foot on our closest neighbor in space, there will be many lunar probes to test the character of the moon. Our first step is to fire a probe ahead of the moon. Caught by the moon's gravity, it makes a reverse orbit and comes looping back. In this probe vehicle, there's a television camera to give us our first view of the far side of the moon. Next, we may impact the moon with flares for the purpose of determining surface conditions. Then we'll orbit our neighbor in space with a ship carrying instruments to map the moon and give us other scientific information. Finally, we'll prepare the way by making a soft landing on the moon with an unmanned vehicle. The instruments it carries will radio back the temperature and various other conditions it will encounter. Of course, the natural climax to all these probing flights is to land a man on the moon. And that means projecting a human being on a trip of over 200,000 miles across the sea of space.
As a stepping stone to the moon and beyond, manned satellites will be used. Assembled in space, the various parts of the satellite will be delivered into orbit by space freighters. Workers taken to the location by a shuttle plane will complete the job. Due to the weightless condition that exists, men will easily be able to handle equipment which they couldn't even move on the ground. The operating crew will be boosted to the orbiting satellite and with the aid of a precise automatic navigation system will be put into the right place with the right speed at the right time. Then the passenger carrier will overtake the satellite and transfer the crew. Periodically, the operating crew will be relieved and fresh crews transferred into the satellite. With the transfer completed, the shuttle craft and its pilot glide back to Earth. The satellite itself will be in perpetual motion and will stay in its orbit forever unless it is deliberately brought down. As it moves through space, the satellite might be used as a training station for personnel and to extend or increase military reconnaissance. And with men capable of making more selective observations than were previously possible, additional weather and map-making information could be collected and evaluated. Scientifically, it will serve as a telescope viewing platform, free from the heavy curtain of atmosphere that obscures the planets and stars from astronomers on Earth. Finally, a manned spaceship assembled at the satellite will leave for the moon. Arriving at the moon, the manned spaceship may go into orbit or may approach the planet directly. If the direct approach is made, retro rockets will slow it down as it closes in on the target. There will be many trips to the moon, probably serving as practice for other missions farther on and for observation of our galaxy. The moon will be only the beginning of a tremendous new age of exploration. Beyond the moon and out to the fringe of infinity shine celestial beachheads beyond counting. And all the while we're reaching for the moon, other unmanned probes will be scouting the interplanetary skies. These snoopers, possibly using ion motors powered with vaporized metallic fuel, will ultimately head for Mars. Their ion motors supply only a small thrust, but in the airlessness of space, a little push can send the snooper rocketing along at thousands of miles an hour. As it is drawn into orbit by the gravity of Mars, the snooper's television cameras and other instruments will send back reports on this planet about which man has so many questions. Are there ruins of long dead cities on Mars? What are the lines we call canals? Today, nobody knows. But one day, the answer will be known around the world. This may be a home scene sometime in the 1980s, perhaps even sooner. From a manned spaceship heading for Mars will come one of the most exciting on-the-spot telecasts in history. This is Commander Wilson reporting to Earth from Operation Mars. This is the 260th day of our voyage. We will soon begin orbiting as soon as we come within the pull of the gravity of Mars. All members. While planetary exploration will become a reality, it's not as easy as some people would have us believe. We're dealing with tremendous distances. Earth is 93 million miles from the sun. Mars is nearly 49 million miles beyond us. Saturn is 480 million miles from the sun. And the planets stretch out clear to Pluto, nearly 3,700 million miles away. The nearest star in our galaxy is Alpha Centauri, which is 3,000 times as far away as Pluto. And our galaxy is only one of the many island universes that extend beyond our conception. Besides the problems of distances, 
we still have much to learn about cosmic rays, radiation, meteorites, and the effects of weightlessness. There's more to be known of the different kinds of power. But we're learning more every day, with every test. And with every missile probing the wilderness of space. There's only one question for which we have the final and absolute answer. Will man conquer space? And the answer is yes. And why does man reach out to learn the secrets of space? Did Columbus know? Or Leif the Lucky? Or Magellan? Cortez? Sir Francis Drake? Could any of them put into words the call of unknown seas? The strange fascination of distant horizons. West of these, out to seas colder than the Hebrides, I must go. Where the fleet of stars is anchored and the young star captains glow. Above and beyond us arcs the sea of space, and the enchantment of the far unknown stirs the spirit of the explorer. Restless, curious, man will conquer space because he wants to know what lies over the hill, what lies beyond the barriers of Earth. His very existence is a challenge, and the end of that challenge is the farthest sweep of the imaginative mind of man.